Hey, welcome everybody. Um, another great opportunity to get together on Friday morning or Friday, wherever you are, whatever time of day it is, and talk about trend following and other things, things about trading or um, slaps. Yep, a lot of slap talk going on this week, um, dominating social media. Um, so anyway, it's got a big day ahead of us. We have um, our usual get together this morning and then 11 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to go over to Twitter and Spaces and um, talk with Tom Basso about his type of trend following. And, you know, sure, we'll start out with volatility management. It's volatility targeting, but uh, management's good, too. I mean, I don't do either one, but I think uh, it'd be fun talking to him, and hopefully it all works out with this uh, with the Spaces platform. I did a Spaces this week, testing it out on Monday, I think. I'm not sure why I did it. Oh, someone recommended I do Spaces. Why don't you do Spaces? I'm like, okay. So I did it the next day, and it was pretty good. We had almost 300 people, so I think it's a bigger forum because of Twitter, and I have 20-some thousand followers on Twitter, so... Um, I guess some people tuned in who had never been to Clubhouse. But anyways, um, it'll be fun to to have that conversation with Tom. And we tried to get Rob, but uh, maybe we'll get Rob next time or another time. So uh, anyways, just wanted to open it up with that little monologue and see how everyone's doing. And um, uh, send me some questions uh, in the chat if... Um, you want to or raise your hand and um, we'll bring you up on stage. You can be part of the discussion. We need to broaden it out a bit and um, we'll do that in spaces as well. So good morning, Oleg. Uh, hello. Hi to everyone. As I always said and uh, will say in the next episodes, I'm always very happy to be here. It's my credo. And I'm now in uh, Belarus. Uh, I feel happy here. A lot of beautiful, good people, kind people uh, who have the same point of view that I have on many events. So it makes me happy. And uh, so that's all <laughs> now for now. Good day, Jerry. Good day, everyone. Jerry, I'm sorry I missed your Twitter Spaces um, earlier in the week. What was the uh, what did you discuss on that particular um, episode? Wow, good question. Um, I don't remember, but um, I think some of our usual Clubhouse people were on there, and then uh, I think Spaces makes it very easy to record, so the recording is out there. I think it was an hour only, but we had a pretty good group. And like I said, 200 and almost 290 people. So, um, but hopefully it'll all work out today. I don't, I think it's pretty easy to figure out. I had never done it before. So hopefully we'll get time on there and it won't be a big deal. I just experimented with it. Um, but um, no intention of leaving uh, clubhouse, of course. Yeah, no, no, no problems. The same functionality pretty well um, that we have here at Clubhouse? I think so. As far as I know, I think it was a bit easier. I think they have a couple of features that, um, I think one feature is mute everyone. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, I don't know. Uh, you can't really mute anybody on Clubhouse. I have to move them off the stage if they... Um, if something's said or if, if we don't like something that's being said or they're dominating too much or if their mic is not muted and we hear things in the background. So uh, then they come right back. But I think on this you can mute, mute people or I, I'm pretty sure I saw a mute everyone button, which, of course, with our, with <laughs> like our, that. <laughs> with our group, we, we, we would never have to use, I'm sure. Can I get one of those in real life or no? Uh, there's a wife joke in there as well, I'm sure. I said in real life, but yeah, <laughs> that hurt too. I'm just wondering whether we should um, prepare and bone up for this um, debate with Tom Basso, Jerry, talking about volatility targeting, 
perhaps we, we need a prelim here in this clubhouse before we go out into the fray and, um, and debate with Tom. I know I have extensive notes and I took, and I made some new ones, uh, this, this week, but, um, you know, one of the things is we kind of like we're joking around about how um, we'll gang up on Tom, especially since Rob's not here. But I think that the majority of the people, probably the majority of our group is uh, very tolerant of some ball management, uh, which I'm not against it on a discretionary once in a year basis, let's say. But just recognizing it, it is uh, not very systematic, but I think um, most people don't have too much trouble with making it an integral part of what they do. And I think in general, uh, it, we, we are in the minority. And um, as relates to, I mean, I think it's just uh, assumed that all CTAs and trend followers of all size, and um, we got to be on the lookout for that sort of misdirection. Oh, you don't believe in ball sizing? So I've had that happen as well. You know, they, they get backed into a corner and they start uh, making up our argument for us. Uh, no, of course, we believe in ball sizing. It's just that uh, once this outlier or trend gets going, we just like to press the bet. And, uh, you know, essentially it gets back to this root um, idea, which is uh, what is the risk in, implicit in let your profits run and take small losses is um, the trade loss. We're going we're gonna to be so awesome at money management plus with our diversification and small bets that we're going to take small losses and uh, let profits run. So we're by definition going to separate those two types of trades. Um, whereas the more mainstream uh, trend following is portfolio, um, portfolio performance and volatility and sharp. And, uh, and so we tend to focus on Let's do the right thing and focus on each trade, do the right thing with each particular trade, and then we'll see, uh, oh, how's our portfolio doing? As sort of an afterthought, almost. You know, we're not going to get crazy uh, without having any sort of um, portfolio cutbacks or, you know, risk controls. We stay in the game. But I think it's back to the root problem. The root difference is are we looking at the trades? And is our discipline on each and each individual trade, or are we sort of relying upon this back test of the portfolio? Um, anyway, see how I can get going. It just it just becomes me and me just talking. But yeah, I think we have an hour in between at least between uh, ten and eleven a.m. to refer back to our notes. No problems, Jerry. Listen, just, just out of interest, when did you first start hearing about volatility targeting measures? Because I'm thinking it's sort of like a symptom that probably emerged in the early 2000s. And I'm just wondering whether it's also associated with the growth in the European CTAs. Have you got any thoughts about that? Oh, yeah, I think you're right on. That's exactly what happened is um, <clears throat> they... Uh, took the managed futures by storm uh, with making it a bit more holistic and complex. And no one likes these drawdowns because you're only promising, well, the future will be better if we let these profits run and exit only when the system exit is elected. Well, that's a future promise, but I'll take care of this issue right here and now and uh, if coffee gets too volatile, I might cut back on my crude or I'll definitely cut back on my coffee. And then we'll definitely uh, make this a portfolio, a much better portfolio experience. And that's kind of what even Tom was saying in his tweets is that um, I need to sleep at night and, and this um, <clears throat> and I need and, and clients won't ha uh, sit with this and uh, they won't put up with it and so we're going to do what the client wants us to do plus we kind of like it as well you know it's not like they don't like it um and i think we just need to point out if there's any evidence that uh, it's not you know this is another phrase that, um, that they're that uh, you know i hear a lot and that is it doesn't matter what you do 
it's all the same. Everything's created equal. You know, um, what other part of life is like that? Well, it doesn't matter what choice you make. It's your personality. If you don't like this fall, get out. There's no downside. Um, and it's seemingly only a, only downside if you stay in and don't fall target. It seems an unnecessary um, suffering that we're doing here with <clears throat> with um, not scaling back these trades. And I think we just need to point out if we see any evidence that no, it's it's not a good choice. You're making it is two distinct choices, and one is superior than the other. And I think that's our our main issue is that there there is a superior way to do this. Everything is not created equal. You should not pursue what suits your personality. Quite the opposite. I mean, I think to a large degree, there's <clears throat> some of us believe that pursuing hard things and difficult things is a more a better path in the long run if your goal is to maximize your wealth. Uh, I like uh, I like very much uh, the words of uh, Moritz Sibert, as I remember, uh, when he said that this particular trait, the single trait, is meaningful. It looks meaningful only because that it's happening now. It's um, so it's uh, only psychological situation and i think about this a lot that in many areas of our life it is so this situation that we face now uh, it can be meaningful because of only emotional aspects and nothing else and I think that we must um, think about um, long-term perspective, long-time horizon. And it's very, very important for all of us. And I'm not talking, I'm talking not about the trading or business, uh, about maybe relation, relationship with the people or something like that, because um, when I decided to be a trader, a lot of people said to me that it's not a good idea. and. Even now, some people say that they don't understand what it is. Why are you doing this? There is no such um, a profession, even so, because in Russia, people don't understand. Uh, they have no finance uh, education in this field, a lot of people. So I must have uh, an OV. I think I'm, uh, I'm talking about myself, that I understood that I must have my own opinion, my own point. It might be, may, must be based on a um, theoretical and practical approach. And um, I must not look, um, maybe I must look <laughs> in the direction of my movement. So. I like this trend following philosophy, trend following ideas. I was interested that uh, George Coyle made the mention in Twitter that he believes that, you know, there are, you can either volatility target or you can not volatility target. And really, uh, you know, there, there's no clear distinction between the two in terms of overall performance. But I, I tend to push back on that idea a bit because... I personally think that this use of volatility targeting has been something that was see, been seen that's been introduced from about early 2000s up to current day. Before that, I think we could probably refer to the techniques deployed as classic trend following. And then after that, uh, you know, 2000 period with the European CTAs coming in, um, the, the, the changes being made to the models to smooth the equity curve. I think that these, I, I, my gut feel tells me that <clears throat> volatility targeting as a, a basis to smooth equity turns has been successful during this particular regime, which I feel is a sort of regime dependent condition. And I just, I believe that if, for instance, we find that markets exhibit this tail behaviour more and more going forward, and we've certainly seen it in the last three years, we've seen the resurgence of the classic trend followers now um, accelerating away from the, the trend following mob, the rest of the trend following mob who observe these practices. And so 
ideally in a theoretical world where there's unlimited uh, potential upside ability in highly volatile markets, if that's the case, then I do believe that not volatility targeting is a superior um, basis, um, as opposed to George, George's impression that they're effectively equivalent. So what's the big argument about? That's exactly right. Um, it's just that uh, some, some people just want to go there so quickly. And so I'm just more of a competitive person with myself, especially because I want to be the type of person who, you know, at the same time, if you're going to um, emphasize research and, and gradual improvement and learning, which I think is what we all want to do, we want to get better, then um, I don't think that the corollary, corollary to that is, well, regardless of what you find, the bottom line is, does it suit your personality? Um, I mean, I think to some degree, you have to have a system that you can do, but that's not the only um, alternative. It's don't trade. If trading is hard for you, implementing good ideas and hard ideas, then maybe it's not for you. And maybe it's not going to work out in the long run because you'll uncover as the markets move forward um, reasons that what fits your personality are pretty devastating in real time and in real life. Um, so I, I really don't understand this sort of go-to phrase of, hey, let's all lock arms. We're all in this together. Whatever you do is the same as what I do. Um, I mean, I think to some degree, these trend following systems, they all make the same amount of money within a range, you know, which is great, but it doesn't mean we can't improve them all. And we shouldn't try to improve them all. And we shouldn't sort of just default back to, well, we're, we're all the same. They're all equal. It doesn't matter what you do. I mean, really, is that what your scientific research has shown? Because mine has not shown that. Um, and then back to your other point you made. I remember in uh, some periods, maybe the early 2000s, the, the, the vol management is purported to um, help with risk. We're going to redefine risk as volatility, not as the permanent loss of capital. And um, this is a risk control thing. And uh, OK, but then in some of the early early 2000s, we had some short term trends that would uh, have dr dramatic increases in volatility. And then um, the, the vol management would help then as well. So it kind of doubled as risk control because we redefined risk. Uh, away from a trend following view of risk. <clears throat> and then also, oh, thanks, we got some profits too. I like that. So I remember a cotton trade that probably made 15 or 20 ATRs in, a, in about a week or two, and then uh, crashed back down and I took a small loss. And then the vault targeting, so seductive because it, it took some of that profit off the table because uh, the vol increased. And so uh, it, it does serve both. And, uh, but I do think that uh, there's some major problems to it. And uh, when you have, as you said, when you have these big trends that we haven't seen in a while, um, <clears throat> I think uh, it doesn't look as good. And uh, I guess another, th another thing I like to talk about is, you know, essentially I think what you're saying is you can't trust the back test because you may see more big trends in the future uh, than we've seen in the past, and that could um, render your <clears throat> your desire to do a lot of vol management a really bad idea. Uh, when I, I agree, Jerry. Um, look, the, the, in this sort of new definition that we're sort of um, uh, moving towards, it's hunting for the outlier, you know, like. By definition, these outliers are these anomalies, these non-predictive anomalies that have such magnitudes that um, you know any any predictive mind um, would always underestimate them. That they'd, they'd never be able to sort of um, fathom uh, the the significant magnitude of these events. And and they're the they're the actual um, market features that we are targeting with our technique. So to say that trade what your personality declares like that basically goes against 
the entire edge we're seeking, which are these outliers which can't be predicted. Even we, when we're on these things, we want to sort of take profits off the table. Of course we do. But because we can't anticipate their, their magnitude, we've got to basically leave it in the hands of the market to dictate um, our, our wealth to us. Um, as soon as we adopt measures that start you know, downsizing our positions to take profit off the table, um, to, to turn the unrealized profit into realized profit, we are sacrificing the possible unlimited magnitude of those events. So it, it is an uncomfortable technique. We've, we all agree to that, but it is the very necessary technique to develop the edge that is so enduring and the reason why probably this edge has been enduring over hundreds of years and hasn't been arbitraged away is because it is so psychologically difficult. So I'm really comfortable with um, the way we are now viewing trends as these outliers, these unusual events, things that our back test will not pick up because these things are not repetitive features of the market. These are anomalous, um, endogenous events that are huge in magnitude might only happen you know once twice three times and their forms are going to be completely different each time they don't won't necessarily all translate out to be the nice same form of trend some of them are going to be explosive exponential moves some are going to be long drawn out moves they're all different so our back test in relation to uh, the, the outlier component of our trades is going to be meaningless to us. We don't know what the future is going to be, when these events are going to occur. The risk is something that we can use history as a basis to define our risk mitigation methods for the strategies that we use to deploy to attack these outliers. But the profit side of our equation is, you know, unknown. Um, and, 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 you know, I was very interested that <clears throat> when I looked at... Um, um, uh, strategies that had high positive skew. As soon as you start tampering using volatility targeting, you reduce the skew. You start turning it towards negative skew. And interestingly, this is, this is what I've found, is that strategies with very high positive skew um, typically are strategies that do not engage in current market behaviour. They are looking for extraordinary behaviour that is not the current regime. They therefore have many, many small losses while they're waiting for this extraordinary behavior to occur. And then once this, this um, behavior does occur, they get these massive moves and this very high positive skew. But as soon as you start reducing that positive skew um, and, and reducing it, you, you start finding that your strategies are starting to adapt to the, the qualities of the regime you're in. In other words, they're starting to adopt almost like a, a curve fitting stance or an overfit stance to the current regime. And that's what I fear with these methods of volatility targeting, because I have a feeling what they're doing without realizing it is they're overfitting their models um, because all of these decisions they're making for their individual trades like taking profit off the table, reducing their position side, it's adding variables into their strategy. And that inherently is making our simple strategies far more complex. And it is a response that is actually overfitting to the current regime. That's, that's what I feel is a problem with these methods. Of course, that's, what, that's the answer to every question. Every question has the same answer in trend following. What is the sample size? And that's why I don't wanna play all of my cards in the clubhouse. Uh, who knows? Tom may be listening, you know, and uh, we want to own a, but that's definitely the big deal. I'm not going to do it. That's the only reason. I mean, that's the reason I can't do it because it's not this one entry, one exit stop loss that yields this amazing sample size, uh, continuing every day to adjust my positions based upon the volatility in the market. I don't even know where to count. How do I count? Am I counting? What am I counting? It's this love of the back test. This is what we're going to see because we've got it in the back test. It's legit because we did this back test. Look at all these equity stats. Look at these. This is what we should expect. And, and I say, no, um, I'm looking at the sample size in the trade stats. My average win is three times as large as my average loss. I'm betting. 
I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. More outliers, less outliers, where they're going to come from. I just know that if my average trade is healthy and it's much bigger than my average loss, then I will probably be able to stay in the game um, and I'm going to kind of ignore you know, everything else. So I think that is really the key is, is this um, sample size. And I forgot your last sentence because I was going to write it down, but it was a good one. Um, so hopefully we can uh, sit back and not attack. <laughs> you know, I'm a cult leader. We're, we're ready for them, Jerry. We're ready for them. Yeah, I'm a cult leader. Evidently, according to that, um, yeah, according to that um, <laughs> triangle. But uh, I think to some degree, um, I'm also, I, I think I skip a lot of those levels and go from cult leader to scientist. And uh, the scientist in me is just going to continue to harp on sample size. Do whatever you want to do as long as you have um, – a legitimate large sample size. Um, and hey, I guys. think. Th hi, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks for the for the incredible opportunity to to talk every week, Jerry. Um, I, I don't know if I've expressed myself uh, as well uh, last times, but I'm immensely grateful for all that. And thanks for the for the coming sparring with Tom Basso. I wonder if he has his own clubhouse session preparing with his with his acolytes, just like you do. <laughs> and, They're doing yeah. a prelim now, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on this, on this uh, topic, I, I feel that the, the discussion is based a lot of our, on our um, uh, preconceptions of what trend following is and, and how to um, best um, exploit its, its characteristics. But I, I was, uh, while you were talking, I was, I was wondering, on a, um, um, a simple exercise that may prove um, our point. Imagine you have a, a price series that you transform it, and, and then you transform it. Each day, um, you, you normalize the, the, the price movement by the previous day ATR. You know, and, and then you apply a trend following system on that, on that, on that transformed price series, a, a, a simple breakout um, um, system on that transformed price. Um, when you do that, it is as if, I, I wonder, um, it is as if you're um, normalizing your, your position by previous day volatility. So I, I want to run this, this, this back test, this exercise and see what it, um, what, what's the result. But I, I imagine, or oh, I have a hunch that it will it it will show much uh, more um, um, much less extreme moves. If if you're if you're normalizing by previous day ATR, the the next day that you expected to to hit the ballpark, it will not actually hit the ballpark. It will be a much more muted um, uh, movement because the previous day ATR was much bigger. So in the end. When you put all these um, uh, all these trades on a on a sample uh, of of this transformed price series, you will have a, a, a distribution of trades that is much much less asymmetric than the one we find when we do not transform the price series and have this uh, and have the, the 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 beautiful asymmetry that we expect to to find with our breakout systems. So perhaps this is a way to 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 show um, the 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 unbelievers of our cult <laughs> how how that uh, how that how that works. That we are we are looking for the outliers. We are looking for that um, extreme price moves that will show up only when volatility expands, like Richard tells all the time. If we're normalizing by, by volatility. It just will not expand as as you as you wish it would, and well, okay, you're you're giving up um, that uh, right side uh, of the tail of the, of the distribution where things are so so positive. What do you get back? Do you do you get back your your um, your left um, 
your left tail. No, you don't, because it's it's fixed on that three ATR loss or five ATR loss or whatever you have for for your loss. So I don't see that. I, I don't. I don't agree with the with the with. I, I can't see how this can be better than simply let your profits run. Uh, when we are talk, I think that uh, when we are talking about back test or something like this, uh, first of all, for me personally, I think about the logic behind the back test, behind the strategy, and uh, for example. If we do a back test of artificial intelligent strategies or maybe carry strategies or something like that, artificial intelligent I think is a good example, that we can see a pretty good result for maybe 20 years, I don't know. I did not do, do this back test, never did this, but maybe it's only example, theoretical example. but. If we do, we can see uh, very good results. But in fact, like Neil said many times, that uh, it we do here only with uh, the past, and uh, it's the, we are talking about the past environment and nothing like that. Only this. So we uh, can see a parameters uh, that uh, was chosen that uh, that worked for maybe 20 or 30 years because of uh, reasons and it has reasons why it worked but we don't know these reasons and we must not to know this but in fact Neil said very good words that when this environment will be changed the system also will be changed uh, so it uh, will you can lose all your money on your account and um, maybe theoretically um, even if we have 1000 years of a back test of artificial intelligence and it worked very perfect in a very perfect way um, it can be not uh, it cannot be so in the future uh, we know that we can face and we face we always face uh, during our history, we always face something that we have never seen before, and our transforming strategies works very good in such circumstances. And I even want to say that we are we have good profit when we see something that we have never seen before. We have a lot of example of this. It's Corona crisis. It's crisis of two thousand eight. It's um, these events we can see now, and all these. Uh, if we are talking about Corona crisis, I think that only maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I understand that only transforming system, including my transforming system, by the way, shows good results. Showed good results in March 2020. Uh, so, like Jerry says, um, often say, Jerry often say that. Uh, we will uh, face unpredicted events. We will face uh, that never happened before uh, events, such type of events. And in fact, we see that trend following uh, do good with this. Uh, trend following, it's good for trend followers and it's not good for any maybe other strategies. I don't know any other strategies that so we not only deal with the past we it's only a part of our back test a part of our logic it's to see how it works but we see very many different circumstances very very different circumstances in in all that circumstances trend following was uh, perfect i think perfect and this is real why it's so important why it's um, so like Mark Jabrzinski said that it's an asset class that gives you money when other asset classes will lose money. Hey guys, uh, one of the practical issues that uh, I face with this idea of uh, volatility targeting and I trade stocks so I'm not sure if this uh, uh, idea applies to diversified futures traders you can tell me but anyway 
uh, well, I've thought about this volatility targeting, looked into it, and to me, it's basically like taking partial profits, right? And uh, so when I have this, uh, when I'm trend following stocks and uh, these positions are moving in my favor, if I start uh, cutting the winner, like taking money off the table, uh, every time it gets extended from the mean or, or increases 20% and another 20% for, and etc. So if I take these partial profits, what am I going to do with the capital? I need to find new risk to, to keep my money working, you know. So uh, I don't want to sit in cash in a rising market. I want to be invested. I want to uh, I, I wanna let my money work for me. Uh, but every time I take uh, some uh, off from a position, I need to find a new uh, new place to put the money work. So I need to trade more, I need to open new position, uh, maybe take a loss from there. So basically, I see it less riskier to keep that capital uh, working in my position that that is that is winning, like that is uh, going in a right direction instead of taking capital out of there and trying to find a new position to put the money to. So I'm not sure if it's maybe it's um, like uh, my personal issue because I trade only stocks, but I see even if you trade like diver diversified futures portfolio, still, if you volatility target, you take money off the table, you take uh, money off the table, you need to put it somewhere else or you're just going to sit in cash and uh, earn uh, much less uh, return that is so spot on marcus you're, you're nailing it on the head so th this is the problem <clears throat> we face in that methods that do this volatility targeting and and in relation to bruno's um, um thoughts before which are very interesting I, I suppose the way um to look at it is that um our trend following models, what, what we do, we actually do use, I, I think I could say this for Jerry, he, 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 he can say if I'm wrong or not, but we do use an ATR based technique on our entry and as a method to um, size our position based on our realised capital. So at our entry, everything is known, our realised balance is known, we size our position using an ATR based um, method. So in other words, with high volatility, that bet size is going to be smaller if we're applying the same equal size bet across everything. And if the volatility is lower, that bet size will be higher. However, that's not the real issue. As Marcus says, the issue is the volatility targeting that occur occurs during the trade event itself. This, this method to take partial profits off the table um, during the course of a profitable trade event and that money that, that what what there is an inherent assumption built into that um, assumption of taking profits of the table is that over the course of the time the dominant um, theme will be that the asset is going to mean revert if it if there is a dominant conclusion that the asset will mean revert yes taking profits off the table is a, a good idea however that's not the case when we are, are dealing with these outliers these divergent signals that can go on for many years it's actually the opposite so with our models what we do is when we we enter a position we actually find that we use an atr based position sizing method to adopt the bet on entry and our initial stop is defined at that point in time then what you'll find is that our trailing stops or our exits such as a donkey and channel exit or whatever method we've got as our planned exit gives more breathing room over the course of the trade when we are, are in unrealized profits so right from the the initial start of that trade we know what our maximum adverse risk excursion is going to be based on our realized capital that's our bet then when we are profitable in that trade we are more relaxed we give more room for the outlier to emerge so that's where we are sacrificing some of this possible profit uh, by volatility targeting methods on the basis that 
We never know when we're going to be writing an outlier, but we assume that over the course of a long trade history with our sample size, that it is always preferable to let profits fully run and give them breathing room to do so, as opposed to restrict that trajectory or take profits off the table or smooth our equity curve because we want a derivative expression of the outlier in our trade sample. Um, and, and to do that, we've got to give maximum freedom for that trade to play out. That's where I think the argument lies between our method and maybe Tom's and, and what Marcus was saying is that when you do start taking profits off the table, yes, you are encouraged to therefore, where do I put that money? Where do I reinvest it? You will therefore be inherently adopting almost a cross-sectional momentum method where you are forced to put it into the next highest momentum instrument that you, or signal that you receive. And that mere process, what that process does is firstly, it increases your, 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 um, your, the number of trades for that particular market. And that almost puts you towards an over trading stance for a single market because it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be on an outlier. You're just on a trend at that stage because no one knows when the outlier emerges from their trend. So you increase the, um, the possible whipsaws, you increase the, the minor trends, uh, you, you decrease your frequency or your relative frequency of outliers in your trade distribution. So all in all, it spells sort of end, an end to your possibility to generate the highest possible compound annual growth rate over the long term by that technique. I like this very much, really very interesting. And I want to say, um, I remember now one anecdote about a trader, funny story. Um, it's a joke, of course, that one trader was uh, in a jungle and uh, a stranger gave him a secret strategy and said you will have uh, 10 maybe 5 or 10 percent a day with a strategy with no risk at all and after that uh, we can uh, i saw in this story a set of rules of the strategy because set of rules how to do this how to achieve this goal to have 10 percent a day and in the end of this the stranger said to a trader that this strategy will work only if you know the future five minutes what will be in five minutes in the future you must know it in a certain way so if you know in 100 percent what will be in the future this strategy will work and give you a lot of money if not the strategy will you will lose all your money i think a lot of um, where we're coming from too is that um in, you know in our opinion um the trade level calculation is so important. And so if you've got the trade calculation wrong, oh, uh oh, there I go again. If you have it different from me, then yeah, you may have to make up for that um, issue in another way. Um, I remember talking to a, you know, a, a CTA once and um, he's, he's out there and everybody knows him probably. So he was describing this sort of strategy that he uses with the vol targeting and a heat map. You know, once you get to put on too many trades, you stop doing the trades. Well, that's the cardinal sin. You know, trend followers cannot stop doing trades. They take every breakout, and but not with him. And I ask him, like, well, how do you set up your trade level and how do you do this? And he told me, I'm like, oh, okay, you just have your trade level set wrong. So if you set your trade level based more on the um, realized profit and loss, your capital, then you wouldn't have to do these gyrations in the future to make up for that problem. And his response was, you know, I, I look, I, I've researched the way your performance is, and I could have sworn that our uh, trade level and money management were about the same. I was noticing that you were doing like all the same optimal calculations. And I said, Oh, yeah. So that's what made me think is that I just by the mere fact that I only use closed trade equity, for instance, then I'm sort of free to let these profits run and I'm free to keep doing all the trades. And so I think um, if you're not doing that, but if you're using like today's AUM at all time highs, your AUM, you're putting on trades today uh, after you've made 20 or 30 percent 
then you may have to come behind that and do something that's going to reduce that risk, like take profits. And so you're just in a morass. You're, you're in no man's land because you mishandled the trade level calc. So I think that's kind of part of it as well, that they're doing the back test and they're seeing um, this volatility kind of get out of control, whereas we're not seeing it as much because we're kind of under trading. Our, our trade level calculation is, is forcing us to under trade. You know, given the recent market moves and some of these trends, I've been doing some back testing and looking at ways to get out of nickel quicker or get out of Tesla quicker. And I'm pretty sure that in all my years of testing, you know, I've just never been able to find anything that makes more money than just waiting for the long term breakout exit. And that's what they see as well. We're not going to make more money. So how do we get, how, how can we achieve, uh, how can we justify this ball cutback? Well, we need to redefine the problem. The problem is not uh, compound annual growth rate, it's sharp. If we change the goalpost and say now it's sharp and reducing risk is one of our main goals that can make the sharp look better, then we can add these features. And so that's where they went off, you know, that's where Sharp was mandatory. You must have Sharp if we don't use Sharp, but it's not a normal distribution. It's a fat tail distribution. Be quiet, shut up. We need to do this. And that's why I think if you, if clients went to the more quant oriented trend followers uh, and said, hey, forget that, you know, forget Sharp, I'm okay. Let the profits run. I believe the CTA would say, no, I can't. Number one, I don't believe it. Number two, I need to sleep at night, quote unquote. So it's just a mess, in my opinion. It's kind of a mess to get in. I'm not saying I, and I think I've been there and I, and uh, I was just shaking my head at all the knowledge I had. You know, there was a funny, um, oh, there was a really funny tweet this week um, that I wanted to mention uh, that I, I, I copied down. It was, um, um, something like, I wish I could not know what, I wish I, anyways, I, I'll, I'll find it, but, and, I, and I'll mention it, I'm gonna butcher it, but um, okay, someone else take over. Um, I think that it's very important. Uh, it's very big um, secret that Jerry said to, uh, to us, says, o -o often says, say to us, that uh, this long-term approach, it's very, very important, really. And so, and maybe, of course, as I have said before, investors don't like this. But investors, um, what do they like? When you will have, and you will have, certainly, uh, a period when it's a trending period, and when you will have a lot of money, a lot of uh, profit, they will like it. And when you're in a drawdown, they will not, only this. But we must think about long-term horizon, as I have said before. It's the best approach, the long-term horizon. And so the long-term trading. I know this because I had a lot of I have a lot of my own research before and I have, as I have said before I was a short term trader and I don't regret about this. I'm not I'm not feeling sorry that I was short term trader for maybe many years because it's very good training and I understood a lot that it's not the best idea. But I had uh, understood when I was doing this, uh, I, I had a feeling that it's not the best what I can do, but I didn't have enough data, enough information about this. I didn't have, I understood that I must do maybe for a few years my research and to have uh, to come to a conclusion what I must do better. And because of Jerry Niels and Maritz, and it, it was. <laughs> faster, much faster, maybe even 10 years faster, 15 years faster, and I'm very thankful for that. And so uh, maybe this, uh, when investor, maybe it's an ego barrier, and of course investor, but uh, it's not comfort for them. Of course, if we are doing something that is against our comfort zone, it uh, will be against comfort zone of investors, but as I said a few minutes ago, 
when you will be in a trend when they will see your long-term track record uh, and um, they will not see this long-term track record from your competitors who are carry traders or artificial intelligent traders um, they will not i think so uh, and so i think so the best approach we have my major concern i, I, I look I like the idea of being able to smooth returns. If you could smooth returns, that would be fantastic. But that's not the real story. The real story is when you smooth returns, you increase what we refer to as warehouse risk in your system. So whilst you might be under the impression that those smooth returns are great and long lasting, you inevitably find there's negative skew built into those smooth returns where you suddenly find without warning, you've now got adverse risk events where your drawdowns are far greater than what any trend follower has ever suffered or experienced. So that's my real concern with volatility adjusting and any method that attempts to start taming the equity curve by injecting negative skew or to improve the sharp ratio that's heading towards a story of long-term capital management and that's like whilst all investors of course would love smooth returns they're under a false illusion that there is no risk associated with those smooth returns. There is building risk. There is this warehouse risk because those smooth returns means that you are overfitting your system for a current regime. That's how you get those smooth re returns. What you're not doing is you are not um, giving robustness to your strategy by making it capable of navigating a vast array of different forms of regime, many of which you've never seen in your backtest. So that is my main concern with smoothing and sharp is that it's a false metric that does not um, um, provide necessary information about the uncertainty that is embedded in your trading system. So for me, as soon as you start compromising this volatile signature that we get from our very robust technique that is applicable over many different regimes, we start finding that there is this, this compromise going on where you are sacrificing, um, you, you are starting to build this inherent risk, uh, which isn't measured by Sharp into um, your portfolio and into your systems that suddenly at the turn of a pin comes undone and then you're left either at risk of ruin or these massive drawdowns such as a buy and hold of the s p 500 where it might be down 80 you percent know, with the nasdaq or something uh, that's because you are not preparing yourself for all possible outcomes which is different to our trend for our classic trend following methodology uh, so so give us some examples i mean uh Let's say let's say that the that the only ball management that that is done in this example is just reduction. So they're only reducing, and um, or does your or does your statement have to be um, they have to increase and reduce size of the positions? If ball goes down, they increase. Is it the fact that um, you're at some point in time, because you've taken a small profit, smaller than you should, you could have had in a certain market, that in a later time, um, when you have more losses, then your your equity need needed that large profit that it didn't have because you got out too quick, and because they'll they'll come back and say, how can I be putting myself at more risk when I'm reducing my position? That's exactly right, Jerry. There's this this. Um... You know, there's the, the natural sort of, there's a profit and there's a loss. There's a symmetry going on there. So if you sacrifice your profit potential to achieve smoother returns, that sacrifice is being re reflected by a, an increase in your risk exposure. So I know it's, look, it's not a cardinal sin to talk about volatility targeting with trend following methods. But what I'm saying is it is a, a polluting tactic that degrades your performance over the long term by sort of um, healing to the this this false premise that smooth returns are safer and smooth returns are what are more appealing to investors it's incorrect the, the 
the smooth and anyone can window dress over a period of a stable market regime we saw window dressing occurring with long-term capital management over that stable regime they had this magnificent straight line equity curve i've seen that with many algorithmic strategies that might last between five to ten years they look incredibly stable incredibly good sharps um, almost a linear ascending equity curve but then you get these risk events that the back test has never seen that suddenly massively increase your risk exposure in a, in a heartbeat you know to 50 percent 75 percent drawdown 80 percent drawdown um, that is because of this polluting effect of the assumption that smooth returns uh, means less risk. The, the, the nature of the volatility of the equity curve does not equate to risk. Uh, I, so you're getting back to this issue that volatility does not equal risk. And then they would say that's what everybody else believes. It does equal risk. Um, and so I think if you just can convince yourself of that, then, um, and if they're resizing their trades based upon current equity, they may not be too far off that they really are um, putting themselves in a bad situation um, risk-wise by putting on these bigger positions uh, because they've made so much money recently. Yeah, I think that uh, we are talking maybe in some way about fitting the personality again. And of course, I fully agree that if a person wants to fit his personality very much, it's very the better decision not to trade at all. So I think so. And I think that, and I see this in practice, and I think that if you want um, to, it's like maybe the law of gravitation. The person wants the law of gravitation to fit his personality, and so you don't want to go downstairs in his uh, from his apartment. Uh, he wants to go from the window because he wants uh, to this law of gravitation fits his personality, and he will safely land to the ground. I think something like that we see here. This yes, of course, it's uh, maybe cultivated uh, in mass media and, uh, and everywhere, fitting the personality of a person. The person must love himself very much, fit his personality, live a very comfort uh, life. But um, the world does not organize in a such way. So first of all, we must uh, we must fit the laws of nature. So I found that uh, quote that I wanted to mention a while ago, and that is, um, I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. And I thought uh, that's pretty good because I've been in that same situation. You know, when you only know that you should buy the breakouts and have a stop loss and exit on the breakout, you know, you that's pretty good. You're OK. You're going to be great and just keep adding markets and diversifying. And as a babe, that's in trend following, uh, when I first learned, that's all I knew. And it just took many years to uh, corrupt my thinking and to ward off bad ideas. And I have one of my sons, you know, he, he likes to trade and, he, and I'm teaching him trend following. And he's not interested in anything except putting the trades on. And his mother is like, is he smart enough to trade? you know, what does he know? And I'm like, he knows what he knows. And he's not going to be asking me a lot of questions and that are giving me the impression he's getting off track. And I think some of my other my other sons, they have they would do that, you know, they'd say, well, defend this idea. What about this? What about vault targeting? You know, so I think not knowing um, is somehow uh, an advantage sometimes, you know, when it would be interesting to ask uh, Tom, and other US CTAs that did you start with the classic trend following? And then what led you? Well, it was this European invasion, the quats merging with trend following. And uh, hey, that sounds like a great idea. It's, um, it's we're moving, we're, we're, we're evolving, we're adapting, we're adding, we're, we're becoming better. And um, it really irked me, you know, honestly, over the years that some of these uh, guys and you know not just europeans because the americans agreed with them 
mean, we're in a distinct minority with this classic approach. And but some of the uh, Europeans would call out the turtles and Richard Dennis and say, well, you know, that's simplistic. That's um, more elementary. We're here to show you a better, newer way. And um, so that kind of got me going as well. You know, I, I, honestly, you know, that is a lot of my motivation that it just made me so mad. And, uh, and they got a lot of assets because they were giving people what they wanted this watered down version, even if they all should have known better. And they were criticizing me. I mean, they're criticizing my, my mentors and my, my strategy and not, um, I just want to say, Boris, I'm trying to get you up here. I don't know what's, it's a bug in uh, clubhouse because I've invited you up like a dozen times and it still won't let you on stage. So sorry about that. Might be worth uh, closing this uh, clubhouse totally and then reopening it. Maybe that works. And I want to say that I know one Christian monk, uh, Greek Orthodox Church, from Greek Orthodox Church, he said um, he was talking with one woman, and I don't know about what he was talking, but I have heard his phrase, knowledge is always a system. And I appreciated this phrase very much, that if we want knowledge to be useful, it must be a system. So we must not know everything in the world, but we must know what we must know if we want to do something in the direction of something. So I think that it's, uh, first of all, firstly, important to know what is important. And after that, it's very interesting to maybe to understand how another strategy works, how it, but it's not important in, at all. We have a simple approach. I even don't know all, and I think that not many people really, even at Transformers, understand in 100% why Transformers works. But I understand enough to trust the strategies. I understand enough, and I said that before, I trust it, uh, 100% trust trend following strategies. And it gives me confidence and uh, only in such circumstances, only with such approach, I think I can be successful. I think a lot of bad habits have crept into trend following, particularly in the last decade. And that's because those bad habits have actually been rewarded by the market regime. And therefore, people come to the conclusion, ah, well, then that's a, a logical process to incorporate into my trend following system because it's worked so well for 10 years. But where I think we come undone is this, we, we, we tend to sort of adapt our systems in response to the bias emerging from the conditions over a particular regime. And I think that's where we err, and that's a mistake that can be made by trend following. Because I think that if conditions do get more exotic, far more volatile, I think you'll see a mass resurgence back to the core principles of classic trend following, which I think have naturally been diluted over the last decade. Yeah, so Boris is in the chat room and he says, um, Jerry, his reason for moving from the classic approach to vault targeting was his silver trade. It's in his book. Yeah, you know, I, I can sympathize with this and I do sympathize with all of this, but uh, and that is that um, there are some trades out there that, is, that they basically made hundreds of ATR profit and almost any uh, breakout exit gave all the profit back. And if that's the silver trade of the late 70s, early 80s, I think things like that can scar you. And you're just like, no, I cannot ever handle this again. It's too much. It's crossed the line. And you could continue doing your research and talking to people and come to the conclusion that, okay, the scars are healing now. But, um, and I understand that vol targeting has all these problems and it's going to make less money and has all these negative characteristics that Richard's talked about, but I still, because of that scar, I cannot bear to see a 500 ATR, a thousand ATR profit go to zero. And so 
I can sympathize with that. And I have been on record as saying, don't let that happen. That's, I'm fine with that. I wouldn't let it happen either, if at all possible, because um, I think um, limit down day after day after day, then, you know, there's nothing you can do. So if you didn't do it on the way up, you're not going to be able to do it on the way down. But a daily diet of this, is it integrated into my system every single trade? No, I, I would try to take a more middle ground approach. See how moderate I can be and sound? And that's what I'm going for, this moderate middle ground. Understand um, and, and stay away from the, this idea that, you know, I'm, my personality demands it. You know, this is no. No, your personality needs to be changed. Uh, I, I remember trades that caused scars on me. And um, it was b big volatility, big give back a profit. And I was incensed by this and needed to find methods that um, would prevent this from happening, change my rules. And um, <clears throat> only to later realize that, no, this is going to occur. The major number two, the major problem with that I had with this was that the position was too large. I was trading too large. My risk was too large. And uh, and then, of course, everything gets a lot easier. The more markets you can trade and the smaller the bets you're trading that, yes, you will have these big drawdowns in terms of ATR, let's say ATR entry. That's how I measure my profit. What is the eight? Uh, what, how much has it gone in terms of ATR at the entry? And uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's not a lot of money because I'm trading a lot more markets now, and my risk budget is a lot more reasonable now. But I am sympathetic to all of this. Um, but there needs to be a more moderate approach in realization of the damage that can be done by taking small profits w with a system that has a 40% win rate. And then this is, this is another thing I'll bring up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one of my big secrets is that when, when I've done the back test on this, and it makes perfect sense, of course, that if you use vol targeting, you have to trade larger. Of course you do, <clears throat> because you're taking smaller profits. And so to make the same return, you have to trade a bit bigger. Your average loss has to be a bit larger. So now you're in a you're in a system that has 40% winning trades. You're shifting that risk from open trade equity volatility to capital loss. So your average loss is a bit larger in a method that has 40% winning trades. So <clears throat> this is not moving the risk in the right direction um, because you've heard that cliche. That's exactly right, Jerry. That, that, that's this building of warehouse risk through all of these adjustments that we're talking about. Yeah, because you've, you've heard that cliche, you can't destroy risk, it just goes somewhere else. So what do they think? It's gone? No, it's not gone. You've got it. And here's the other little thing that, okay, I can't expect them to agree with this or maybe any of it, of course is that you have a better sharp ratio now. Well, what happens when you have a better sharp ratio? You can trade larger. Oh my God. Now you're leveraging a, a more wobbly system because of sample size and trading even larger now, not just to make up for the lack of profit because you've taken small, smaller profits, but now you're taking advantage of your genius of coming up with a better sharp ratio. Now you can even trade larger again. There you go. There you go. I'm, I'm like way too nervous, I'm too conservative to do that. So when I look at your performance, Jerry, you don't look conservative at all. You look like a madman with nickel and Tesla and all of these crazy uh, trades that are make that are sloshing around and having all this volatility because they can't see underneath the hood, I'm basing my trade size on the closed trade equity and I'm preser and I'm defending that line and being making sure I don't go below that and, and, and having a drawdown on my capital account. And I'm shifting all of that risk to the open trade equity that looks very crazy and unstable. 
Uh, yeah, I was I was gonna say that the, the risk has to move somewhere, right? And I think Boris was mentioning that um, it will be hard to convince him because it's more psychological um, piece why he's um, adopted that strategy. So I, I I think I think it's almost it's almost as if you're moving, can I say, psychological risk towards the system. Either you warehouse the risk yourself by being strong and keeping the system, or you're doing something to um, make the um, how did I say the drawdown more bearable. So that it, it's obviously if there if you can if you have a system and you can't um, use it or you can't stick with it, then there's no use of that system, right? So in that case, I can see why he's taking an approach. Well, where I wouldn't take that approach, but yeah, I do understand. And uh, I like when Richard said that all these uh, bad things, not good things, are rewarded in a maybe short-term period, and people see that, and uh, memories of people memory are very short, and as Mark Jabrinsky said, that people ch ch change their ideas very fast, investors for example and people see how it works for example with the stock market people see and as Neil said that stock market it's another topic but um, I think it's the similar idea the same idea that uh, people don't understand that it's not good not good because for 16 years from 1976 to 1982 I was doing my notes yesterday and uh, stock market, equity market didn't uh, work well, it um, wasn't in trend and nobody invested in this. And now we can see the opposite situation because, um, and if we are talking about wall targeting, it's um, much more risky than even buy and hold, I think. And uh, it's uh, a problem it's rewarded for and people investors um, uh, can uh, want to give money to the traders who do this but um, as a um, one investment investment banker maybe in a year ago said to me that um, he'll pay for me uh, good money uh, if I will work for him and uh, buy and hold space and really good money on salary on maybe near 10,000 United States dollars a month on the salary, I think and uh, um, it's good for Russia and I said no sir I don't need your money I am a turn follower and I have my approach I have my ideals maybe and I don't want to be on this side but I'm curious to know, actually, if Tom Basso has always been wall targeting, because I've listened to his, him being interviewed on podcasts, and he, he now always says that he's a retired money manager who wants to play golf and, uh, and cook dinner and have wine. So probably he has relatively high net worth and just he doesn't need to be that aggressive anymore. And maybe it's just part of the retirement and lifestyle to... Uh, preserve capital, protect what he has, and and do it more conservatively. Because he's always been a quant and backtested his stuff. So maybe if if you talk to him there, it'd be interesting to ask if if and how much he has backtested it, and what's the backtest result for him, and and if he uh, has always been vault targeting or not. Very very good, Marcus. That's a very good comment. Um, you know, like I said, we've already stipulated that the back test is going to be fine. We like the back. I like the back test. But the reason I have to like it is that the reason I can like it is because I'd have to force myself to use different metrics, not returns or terminal wealth, but something about sharp. Um, and I think that you can see the problem with that. There's a major problem with your initial comment, and that is you don't send someone off with an inferior game plan um, that is not going to do them well because they don't want risk. You know, you can't do that. Like screw up your system and it's not going to make much money, but you'll sleep better. No, no, no. 
You don't do it that way. You say to them, trade this opt better system, this better mm -hmm. approach, smaller, smaller. It's never an excuse to do something that's not going to be first class um, because of your risk concerns. You know, um, you and I had that same concern. Like I used to trade, you know, uh, t 10 or 12 risk units. Now I trade four and a half, but I don't vol target. So there's no, never an ex a good excuse not to do the right and best thing, especially in this regard, you know, just trade really small, trade two units if, if uh, you can't if, and get your risk. And that's the one area that I'm in full agreement on, <clears throat> that your personality has to suit your risk tolerance or you will. And I've, I've had this happen to me. You know, I stopped following my system because I was over trading and I was too freaked out. But never do I adopt inferior methods uh, for any reason, especially because you'll start losing money. And that's worse than uh, not sleeping at night. Tom actually put up um, one of his research pieces uh, for the S&P 500, which I had a good look at. And um, look, I, I, this discussion on volatility targeting, I, I think it's sort of, there is a spectrum here. There are those that are more extreme than others. I think Tom does it lightly. Uh, when I look at how he adopts his model, he's only fairly aggressive with his volatility targeting when things start getting fairly extreme. So um, I think we could possibly say that his sin is less than most, most of the volatility targeters, but um, the, the results clearly over the, you know, from 2000 to the current day um, does show a superior equity curve, but it's not that much superior than a method that doesn't volatility target. And therefore, when you start looking at regimes pre-2000, like from 1970s up to 2000, you will probably find that the non-volatility target method eclipses the volatility targeting method. And um, so... You know, it, it does seem to be regime dependent as far as I can tell. I posted on Twitter a, um, a interview with Cliff Asnes yesterday. And, um, you know, Cliff, they ask him on this, um, in this interview, what is the most important thing about trading? And his response was um, to be able to sit through pain and not give in and continue to do your system and convince your client, you know, convince yourself and convince your client, uh, explain to you, yourself and your client why this is happening and be confident that you can continue to do the trades and you will do the trades and you will be disciplined. And uh, that's, I couldn't say it any better than that. All the stud traders I've ever met over the years, you know, Salem is, in my opinion, the biggest stud ever, because I would talk to Salem in the midst of drawdowns and bad periods, and he would just crush it coming out of that. You know, he just had no conscience. And Rich was the same way. It's just not, I'm not even thinking about not sitting through drawdowns, not, you know, abandoning my system. And, um, but uh, there was one, you know, Cliff is in both camps, kind of this value and momentum. And, um, he, he told this example of asking someone a question about, um, you know, people who don't pay attention to fundamentals and value. And uh, he was trying to uh, put this guy on the defensive. And he says, well, you know, is there any price where you would get out of this stock? You know, you love this stock so much. You're long. You think it's an amazing company. Is there any price? Is there any, like, any, any area where I, I guess he was insinuating that, the price could get so crazy. You know, is there any place you would just say, I've had enough of Tesla, it's overvalued. That was Cliff's assumption. And the guy said, um, if it went down 50%. And everyone on this podcast started laughing about how absurd that was because he was asking this guy a value question, but the guy was a trend follower, I guess. And he was like, oh yeah, I would get out of it if, if it went down. <laughs> so. I mean, Cliff knows better because he's in the momentum trend camp and some of his many, some of his many funds, he, he does trend follow. 
and he probably has the biggest CTA fund, trend following fund out there. Uh, well, mutual fund, that is. So uh, anyways, I thought that was pretty funny that they just all thought it was so hilarious that this guy was so off his rocker that he would say, oh, I, uh, I'm not even thinking about the upside because I'm never going to get out if it keeps going up. But if it does retrace, I will get out. I thought that was pretty funny. I have uh, 500, 400 Google alerts, and I um, love finding things like that. It's just so funny and so encouraging. I'm definitely encouraged uh, frequently to um, – <clears throat> to be out of the mainstream and not trade, try not to trade like everyone else. Kerry, our TT Ameritrade interview was, uh, was good. And I, I liked the fun part when you were asked if you sell the rally or buy the dip and, and you said neither, neither one. And, and by the way, the shirt looks, looked really good also, just like Hugh Hefner in his mansion in a positive way. That's right. I, have to try to do things to um, impress and uh, that shirt is amazing so I wanted to play up that shirt I'm, I don't have the um, guts to introduce the birds uh, to this guy I love being on with Ben he's really funny and he and I get along really well and uh, I think I may have told you this but I'll tell you a secret that um, once I did the show and it was ended and he left his mic on and uh, cause he never says anything to me before or after it's just, we get right into it and he talks really fast and I get really into it. And I've never been able to say to him, thanks for having me on. I just, he doesn't give me a chance, you know, and, or, you know, when I come on or when I leave, I just say goodbye. And, and so I get really nervous, but uh, okay. So this one time he left his mic on, after I had finished talking and, and uh, the camera was off me and he goes, gosh, I love Jerry. <laughs> I thought that was so funny, you know, and because uh, I have been on there before where I let slip. Um, I forgot what word I used, but it was a, not a nice word. I mean, I was just excited. I don't know if it was F-bomb or something like that. And then I'm like, oh, crap, I'm never going to be asked to come back on. I just screwed up and um but no it's a it's a good show and he sort of thought he had it in his head or maybe i had given him the impression that i was um interested in shorting the s p before it actually made a downside breakout and i was like no no never i mean no matter what uh i have no opinions and i'll never put money on any sort of counter trend trade ever so no i but it's a great show. It's kind of fun. And one of these days I'll get the birds on and just, you know, see what he has to say. Maybe that that will be my last appearance. If I bring on my crazy birds. It, it's good. He likes you then because, uh, it, it feels that most of these channels, they want you to tell a ticker entry or a prediction or something that uh, most of the people would want to hear. Yeah. It's always a challenge, you know, to um, to not answer the question the way they want me to, but still be relevant and interesting. And he's better because he knows what I'm going to say. It's just trend following plus nothing. And so uh, and I feel the need sometimes to sort of bone up on some sort of bogus fundamentals to talk about. But um, <clears throat> it is uh, very, very interesting to, to be in, in that world where people are paying attention to charts, but they're also paying attention to fundamentals. And uh, honestly, as I've said before, the best trades are when the fundamentals and the trends disagree. And this whole idea of merging both to get something better, totally bogus. The chat room, the room chat is going crazy today. A lot of people talking on the room chat, answering questions and um, that's kind of, kind of fun but i tell you what let's let's uh quit early it's 9 25 and so we'll be back at it at 11 and so we can rest and uh, prepare uh, for the spaces at 11 a.m eastern with tom if you have any issue 
with the spaces um google it because that's what i did it's pretty easy to figure out but or or direct message me my dms are open so i'll try to help if necessary but uh yeah so hour and uh, about an hour and a half Joey, just be aware Tom, tom's a bit of a novice here with the spaces so am i so you might need to give us a a few minutes in setup to make sure it's all working and stuff um for tom particularly oh of course um you know, whenever I log on to Clubhouse, you know, of course, the nightmare is no one logs on with me. So, um, I mean, Oleg, of course, would be there, but uh, and Oleg and I could have a nice discussion. But um, yeah, I'll definitely, we'll definitely make sure it all happens, and uh, hopefully, we'll get a big crowd. That's why I kind of wanted it to go to spaces because I think it we could get um, lot a lot of people because pe Tom is very popular. He's a very good guy, and I haven't spoken to him a great deal. Um, and hopefully, we can get into more topics if we need to. But probably should keep it to an hour, and um, uh, I'll encourage audience participation as well. But uh, should be pretty fun, and uh, and maybe this is the start of getting more, you know, uh, long-term trend followers talking uh, on 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 social media. This would be fun. But anyways, I'll let you guys go, and we'll see you in about an hour and a half. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jerry. Just a, a quickie. Um, I'll be recording um, this clubhouse and also the Twitter spaces uh, where, you know, I can adjust the volume so it's all heard and stuff. But unfortunately, I won't be able to get out those recordings for tonight's clubhouse or the Twitter spaces until probably um, Sunday, as there's a lot on at the moment. But um, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard. We appreciate Thanks, it. Richard. Good luck tomorrow with Niels as well.